Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fashion Bunker. This is my first podcast. I hope you're enjoying this. Today is all about Chanel. The first podcast is dedicated to the one and only, not Chanel the brand more so, but also, but mostly Coco Chanel, the woman. The one and only who is quite soon, I mean, hopefully by the time her birthday comes, which will be in August, on the 19th of August to be precise, uh, the pandemic will be over by then. Let's hope so. Now, Chanel loved fragrances. She also loved camellias. She loved the flower camellia, but coincidentally, the camellia had no scent. Now, we do know that several camellia flowers today are fragranced, are scented, but the particular camellia that she was so fond of, and also one of the oldest varieties of camellia that were imported into Europe, because camellias stem originate in Asia, they're particularly popular in Korea, to be precise. But the uh, particular camellia that she was so fond of and that she loved so much is um, has a particular name. I'm just going to look it up right now because I have done research on several of them and now I'm mixing up three. The one that she's into, one that she was into very much, was the Alba Plena. Alba Plena. Uh, White, but also available in other colors, but mostly white. It's it's a very juicy flower, and the leaves are highly glossy and thick and meaty. And then you have that extremely white, pure flower with its pure white, milky, almost like balmy, milky, uh, mattified uh, petals to contrast the shininess of the meaty leaves. Um... It's it's a it's a very fascinating plant. The Alba Plena from the family of the I would say Japonica. It almost sounds like Japanese. But also interesting to note that in Japanese the camellia means excellence without pretension and in, and it symbolizes purity and longevity. Chanel liked the fact that it didn't smell because she, A, wanted, of course, you to smell the fragrance that she wore. And, you know, if, if you were to wear number five and you have a camellia on your lapel or whatever, then you don't have to smell the mix of the two flowers. But more so than that, the subdued elegance of the absence of scent is what elevates this flower to higher heights. And this is something very fascinating to note, um, for those of you also following me on Instagram, Super Deco, well spelled together, by the way, uh, the most modest of executions of any sort of style is what Coco Chanel loved and preferred. So she loved her, you would call them modest materials, which is jersey, but then she would also mix it with tweeds. Tweeds can be extremely rich, depending on how complex and complicated uh, the amount of materials and fabrics you're gathering it together to create the tweed. It could be really complex, but it could be also very simple. She mixed camellias into a lot of different... I mean, listen, even in her 31 Rucambon apartment, the chandeliers or the lamps that she designed herself, by the way, she would implement camellia designs and flower, floral arrangements within chandeliers within clothes, hiding behind buttons, underneath seams. The camellia flower is everywhere to be found in, in, the, in the Chanel universe. And so much so that in the 90s, Jacques Paul, who was back then the perfumer for Chanel, created a fragrance dedicated to Chanel's obsession of the camellia. But because he created a fragrance, he decided to attribute to this imaginary well, it's not an imaginary flower, obviously, the flower exists, but he, he 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 gave it an imaginary scent, a concrete scent within a perfume, but it's supposed to evoke what a camellia would smell if it had a smell when Chanel discovered the camellia. And it is said that the camellia was first given to her by Boy Capel as a present, like a bouquet of camellia flowers. We don't know if that's true or not, but, you know... Um, poetry wants it, or a romance wants it, or myth wants it, that it went that way. But we're not sure about that. And uh, so in the 90s, a perfume was born only as a boutique exclusive called Un Fleur de Chanel, which means like a flower by Chanel, or a Chanel flower, or one flower of Chanel. And uh, the camellia is embossed on the package, 
on the box of this fragrance. And so we are immediately led to believe that if a camellia, if Chanel's um, particular variety of camellia had a smell, it would it would smell the way Jacques Paul envisioned it. So if an Alba Plena Japonica had a smell, it would smell like Enfleur de Chanel, which is a very watery, aquatic fragrance, uh, lotusy, gorgeous, very green. And um, and so now we're we're transporting this world of, of perfumes, and I'm thinking, you know, just today, uh, it was brought to my attention that uh, Chanel on their Insta stories on uh, Instagram posted a black bottle of Chanel Number no. Twenty Two. Chanel Number no. Twenty Two is one of my favorite Chanel perfumes. It is the younger sister, if you may, of Chanel Number no. Five. But it is said that Ernest Beau presented Number no. Twenty Two and Number no. Five to Chanel at the same time. It's just that it was released later on, and it wasn't given the right attention that Number no. Five was given because, in many ways, Number no. Twenty Two surpasses Number no. Five in terms of. Uh, the story it tells. But so today, for the first time, I've seen a black Chanel number no. 22 bottle from the Les Exclusives range. It, from the photo that Chanel posted on their Insta stories, it does seem as though it were a 200 milliliter spray bottle, you know, with the magnetic clasp, uh, with the magnetic uh, stopper. But we do not know. And as is typical for Chanel, they're teasing us. Their marketing sometimes is really obnoxious because they just create these scenarios where most of the times, these products don't even hit the stores. A Fleur de Chanel, for example, which was released in the 90s only within boutiques, in the early 2000s, it was brought back by Jacques-Paul Jean Chanel. Uh, again, only to the boutiques for a limited amount of time. It was a 35 milliliter spray bottle, and I did purchase it back then, and then it was gone again, and then it was gone for good, right? But then, two years ago, I saw somebody who was in the fields of grass visiting... I don't know, some sort of Chanel tour that was only, I guess, internal, either for some really special clients or internally within the Chanel work team. And they photographed kind of a present that they got at the Fields of Grasse, which was, guess what, en fleur de Chanel. But not in the 35 milliliter early 2000s bottle, but rather in the newly released, uh, since a short period of time released, 75 milliliter Les Exclusives spray bottles. And so, of course, I went to my Chanel Beauty Boutique immediately and asked them, well, is this ever going to be released? Is this an official thing? And they were asking, and they said, no, this, they do not know where it comes from, why it was given to these people, why it even exists, why, you know, because the whole fragrance had a package. It had, it had its box that said on Florida Chanel. You know, it wasn't just like Chanel used to do in the past with their testers uh, of the pure perfumes, for example. They would just take a generic Chanel glass spray bottle and they just put the sticker of the perfume on top so you would find still today 35 milliliter chanel number no. five pure perfume spray testers but the bottle is actually an allure uh, 35 milliliter bottle so and that is all legit that is a real chanel fragrance they are authentic but that that's what they do so uh i was thinking to myself well maybe they redid on de chanel and they just you know put they made the on de chanel sticker they put it on a Generic Les Exclusives 75 milliliter bottle, and that's that. But no, they designed an entire packaging. There's an entire box designed just for that 75 milliliter uh, Les Exclusives shaped bottle. And it's not the classic 75 ml Les Exclusives packaging. It is a smaller packaging, but it has, you know, the entire the design was made with, with the flower, with the, the font, with the writing, with the inscription on the package of Fleur de Chanel. So I was thinking, well, a re-relaunch, because it was launched two times, a re-relaunch is imminent. It never happened. So similar, we can expect similar to happen with number 22. So, but what else is going down in the world of Chanel? Well, another thing, uh, we're all on lockdown, and this is also one of the reasons why I am recording a, a podcast, talking alone to you guys, uh, because we're all in lockdown, right? The pandemic. So who knows how long it's going to last. But before the pandemic hit, uh, plans were already set in motion by Chanel for, you know, they plan, I guess, even in some cases, two years, maybe even longer ahead about the releases, what's being uh, done, where do they invest, what fragrances are going to be formulated, you know, they do their research and they have their laboratory. So, they are many, many steps ahead of us, obviously, but they, you know, the plan was to release several fragrances this year. 
how these releases are going to happen, how this time, you know, in which time, which time frame, which schedule it's going to happen, we don't know. But the idea was to release um, from the Les Zoo series Paris Edinburgh. Paris Edinburgh will be the fourth Les Exclusive. No, sorry, Les Zoo, the fifth Les Zoo. <laughs> right, we got the fourth uh, Riviera last uh, last summer. So uh, Paris Edinburgh, and it was supposed to be Paris Grasse or Paris Azur, but no, it's Paris Edinburgh. And then in August of this year, uh, we are supposed to see, or a fragrance is supposed to see the light of day. In August, they're probably going to launch it on the 19th of August, the birthday of Coco Chanel, which will be a Les Exclusives fragrance entitled or called Leo or Leon, Lion, because her zodiac sign is the Leo. Speaking of Leo, if you ever Google Chanel's uh, grave in Lausanne in Switzerland, you will notice that there are five lions on her tombstone. And if you really zoom in close, you're going to notice that each and every one of those lions is different. Now, I'm trying to crack that code as well, because every each one of those lions does represent something. And there's a reason why they're different. And it, and it is also said that Chanel herself designed her own grave. And while she was designing her own grave, and this is also something that she herself says in the, uh, the Allure of Chanel, which is a book by Paul Morand, in which he is having a conversation with Coco Chanel during her exile in Switzerland. She said that she wanted to design this grave for herself and to have the place where she's buried open, just to have earth on top and maybe some flowers growing, but no stone to cover her for whenever she was in the mood to go out into the sky and design for the angels that she could. So the only thing, the only rock, uh, the only stone, the only heavy part of this entire uh, grave is, the, is uh, the, the, the tombstone, which is this big, rectangular shaped thing that says, you know, Coco Chanel, Gabrielle, who were their birth date and, and death date, and then you have these lions. But the actual place where she lays to sleep, right, forever, is, it's so beautiful. And, and just like that, she created something, you know, this rich and famous designer woman, right, created something so modest yet again. Her own tomb is not a tomb, really. It's just earth covering her just soil. I find that extremely poetic. She even managed in that instance, in the very last part of her life, to minimize. Minimize, minimize, minimize. So I've been often asked by, by many of you, well, what do you think, Jacob, about um, the new bags that are being released? Every time a new seasonal uh, trend bag by Chanel is released, I, I get these questions, what I think about it. Well, I think by now you might know, I don't think much about these bags. In fact, if I thought anything about them, I would have them. But um, I find them quite vulgar most of the time. I think the boy, the Chanel boy bag, has aged terribly, terribly. I And it's quite a vulgar bag to see nowadays. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, again, we're talking about the tombstone of the grave of, of Coco Chanel, the same she applied to clothing and, and to bags. There is no need. I know this sounds perhaps too purist and too arrogant, but quite frankly, you guys, the 255 bag is perfect the way it is. It does not need anything more. It, and, you know, I'm a big fan of Vivian Westwood as well. And Vivian also says when once she nails a design that she likes and she finds that structure that she likes, she keeps that design. And when people ask her, because she's still alive, we still have... Uh, the luxury of being able to actually talk to her and interview her because she's alive. Chanel doesn't have that luxury. We don't have that luxury. We can't ask her questions anymore because unfortunately she's not with us anymore. But when Vivian is asked about these designs, she says, well, I don't need to design something new because what I have designed and what I really like is what I keep producing because it's good. It functions. It works. Same applies to the 255 bag. It uh, does not have one single element on it that is too much or too many. I mean, throughout time, Things might have been added or slightly altered, but this bag, basically, as is, is, is just so sublime, timeless. It transcends time. There is no need to add extra thick chains, double rivets, grommets, uh, double stitches, adding extra framework. I'm talking about the boy bag now. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a mess. And the designer within the Chanel design team who designed that bag soon after left Chanel for Dior, and then at Dior designed, well, 
I'm not going to say, but guess what bag he designed? It looks exactly like the boy bag. And this is an issue that we have in fashion, in the fashion business nowadays. Um, everything is extremely, you know, quick. So, and, and they keep kind of, these designers keep moving. These designers whose names we'll never know. I mean, if you're working in the fashion business, you do know them, but they're never celebrated because there's always one main head designer that represents the brand and that's it you'll never hear the names of the other ones and this is also terrible that's the way the fashion business works but so let's say somebody's responsible for the bag team somebody's responsible for the jewelry team you know, and they all come together everybody kind of the artistic director gives them the input and then they all kind of go into their ateliers with their own teams and everybody directs somebody and then at the end the kind of collection comes together so this guy did you know the boy bag and then he went to dior and then did a bag for dior and it moves so quickly and these you don't really have the times anymore to develop something organically. Chanel designed the 255 bag organically. It happened out of need, necessity. You know, the metal chains, I've said this in many of my videos, the metal chains are there because uh, prior to that, I mean, mostly chains were made out of fabric or leather, uh, not chains, the straps were made out of fabric or leather. And then just like people on the streets after the war in the 50s, they would, you know, these guys on, on little mopeds or bicycles would ride past women that are waiting to cross the street and the street light to turn green so they cross the street and they would just like cut the straps and pull the bags and and, and flee you know and steal the bags but no coco said well we okay we need a metal chain um and this is just one example but that entire bag is and then the double flap also now granted i have my issues with the double flap originally the double flap uh was made out of a softer fabric so the leather versions of the double flap sometimes are not executed perfectly uh, with certain materials. I'm thinking about, you know, the Timeless Classic double flap. The double flap works much better in the 255 version because it's a softer leather, it's a thinner leather, and it's a leather that is more malleable, so it bends better. But the best 255 is always, of course, jersey, and you could have jersey a blend of jersey and leather, but the interior has to be soft. It has to have that gros grand uh, silky material inside and it's just so beautiful leather on the inside is fine too but the softer it is and the more the internal flap bends better and that adds that layer of sophistication and i mean being more poised if you're out and about you don't have to you know immediately not everybody has to always see what's inside your bag so that double flap adds that extra layer of elegance but also mystery and the 255 just transcends time so what can we add to it to make it better? You want to create a boy bag? The boy bag is, is has aged terribly. It's very limited to the times it was made in early 2000s. And you see it now and it looks like a bag from that time. It hasn't moved on from there. It hasn't aged well. The Gabriel bag is a tragedy. That's when Chanel started implementing the really chunky glazing on those leather bits. And it's it's a terrible glazing. It looks really cheap. It almost looks like plastic rather than leather. And then that shape between like the hard and the soft, it just doesn't work for me at all. I mean, it, yeah, it, it really, the, the Gabriel just does not function. All. Not even one single Gabriel bag is made in France. It's all made in Italy. It's another issue that I'm really, no, not really happy about. And then, you know, cometh forth, well, we had other bags happening, but, um, we we also had the the girl bag. Remember that one? Uh, Lagerfeld was still alive. This the girl bag was around two thousand thirteen fourteen. Lasted two seasons. Nobody bought it, and then they discontinued it. But actually, that one to me made a little bit more sense because it was a jacket. It was like a a Chanel cardigan or a Chanel jacket, and then the sleeves were actually used to tie them together, and then that's how you created the strap for the shoulders, and then the bag was made out of leather and fabrics and tweeds, and I mean tacky but it kind of had this how to had this idea at the core of how to refunction something into something else which Chanel did but not so literally but she did that as well in her in her youth so especially with hats so I can kind of see and also the 255 bag you know was actually a a, a satchel used by jockeys uh, riding horses so she kind of modified it, transformed it for more daily urban city, you know, shopping use. But, uh, so imagine the nine, the number 19 bag that, that came out now. Uh, 
And people ask me, Deco, what do you think about the 19 back? I don't like it. I think those chains are too chunky. I think it's so cringy and vulgar the way that they kind of stitch and attach the chain to the top of the flap of the bag. And then the double C chain um, logo that kind of functions as the part to push to close the clasp of the bag. That chain is too tiny and filigrant when compared to the actual chain of the bag. And then like two together, they clash so terribly. I do like the soft leather and the like the jumbo kilting that works. But you could play with jumbo kilting and soft leather on other shapes of bags. You know, with the 19, it just doesn't work. And trust you me, it's going to age bad. Now, having said that, I am a fan and now you're gonna go what the hell but i am a fan of the uh of the millennium bag that came out in the late 90s but was called a 2005 bag why am i a fan of this particular bag because this was something very much in in the way coco chanel herself would think about future so this bag was very experimental uh, i do have that this bag in a in a gorgeous uh brown suede but this bag is it looks like a <laughs> like a bum and um it opens like a harmonica and it has a hard shell and it's made out of these futuristic materials used for space travel and then they cover it with this leather but it's just, just like made so perfectly and there's so much craftsmanship in it and, and truth be told because of that bag and that bag shape uh all subsequent that's the period when luxottica took over chanel sunglasses or i eye works in general so all of the their eyewear start was officially then produced by luxottica and truth be told the first couple of years up until just a few years ago luxottica would make the chanel uh, boxes the containers for the glasses inspired by the shape of the 2005 millennium chanel bag so that's why if you see older uh late 90s all the way up to the late 2000s uh, Chanel uh, glasses uh, boxes you're gonna ask yourself why do they look like this they look like a little bum they got these like two little things on the bottom and then it opens up and then has these two like screws on the sides that have double c's but those screws don't function really well those screws do function on the bag they're just there for ornamental purposes to remind us of the bag on the sunglasses boxes but anyway I digress. That particular bag, it was an experiment, and it was an experiment that was also sold to the audience, to the public, to the consumer, as an experiment, as something to say, well, Chanel is trying to envision the future. So in that respect, it works, because she would also have these visions, and she would also push the boundaries that way and would experiment. But that was honest. That was an honest step. What is happening right now with the boy bag, with the Gabrielle bag, with the 19 bag, those are trends. That's not pushing boundaries. That's not pushing the envelope further. That's not saying let's create something for the future. Let's create a vision of how we could better life or how things could change. No, that's just creating comfort for the moment, creating artificial hype around it to sell as much as possible, produce as much as possible, maximize profits as much as possible, invest as little time as possible producing each piece, but as opposed to the little amount of time invested in producing it, pushing the maximization of the profits. That's all That's all these bags are. And I'm not there for it. Not at all. So I ain't having it. Truth be told, I ain't having it. And uh, that answers your question if you have you ever had one. But what am I wearing today? I'm, today, you know, I'm all about channel number five. I've been pushing this concept on my Instagram profile um, since, since the pandemic started, since I am in this crazy isolation. And I'm posting a lot of classic visions of Chanel you know <laughs> quite a few people that, that that follow me at a certain point realize that I, I don't follow uh, Chanel uh, the brand on, on Instagram and I always say well of course I don't I'm not a fan of the Chanel brand I'm a fan of Coco Chanel she is to me this a great creature and uh, I just adore her and I would follow her if she were still alive but the brand Chanel should follow me if they were clever. <laughs> Ooh, this was arrogant, right? Ouch, the burn. No, but honestly, like all jokes aside, I I don't like what they've been doing. I mean, the last commercial by Chanel that I really liked was Egoist. And we're talking early 90s. Since then, it's all been a joke, more or less. So 
I don't like their advertisement. I think they're wasting so much money on advertisement right now. It's not the best. It's not the best quality. It, it's so kind of lame. I mean, what was that thing with Kristen Stewart, the, her first Gabrielle commercial with the toilet papers? <laughs> well, that was foreseeing a little bit of the future, wasn't it? This is like two years ago where she was running with all the toilet papers attached to her. I mean, they weren't toilet papers, but everybody made fun of it that it looked like toilet papers. And now look at us now run it with our own toilet paper. So maybe we have to revisit that commercial and see it with today's eyes. But uh, other than that, um, and I hated that commercial, seriously. So to me, uh, Chanel was uh, that opulence and that the beauty of, of a decadent type of uh, baroque, Byzance type of style of Chanel died in the 90s. From the mid-90s onwards, it kind of faded out into something watered down, uh, advertising-wise. Clothes-wise, it has a, it had its ups and downs. Lagerfeld had incredible uh, collections after the 90s, but also some terrible ones. Uh, his last Métier d'Art being one of my favorites, and uh, him revisiting Egypt and kind of grasping on to eternal life because he knew he was dying. That's something really poetic and beautiful. Um... Of course, in all the interviews, if you see older interviews of Karl Lagerfeld, he doesn't say that he he's afraid of dying. He doesn't care. You know, he tries to be cool about everything. Um, I don't know if he was really that cool about whether or not, you know, dying, passing away. But Coco was. She was quite chill about it. She was very, very pragmatic. She was very down to earth about these things. And I mean, designing your own tombstone and grave. What a woman. So anyway, back to my Instagram. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Romy Schneider, not necessarily because of her acting. I do like her acting, but because of her friendship to Chanel and also because of the drama surrounding her life and the terrible way in which she died and the terrible way in which she lost, I mean, her her her, her child and, and, and the love romance ended terribly with Alain Delon. I mean, gee, if there ever was a diva, you know, that's definitely uh, Romy Schneider. But seeing her interact with Coco Chanel and we do have archive photos of Coco fitting her you know for her private wardrobe but also fitting her for in particular the role for Luchino Visconti's Boccaccio 70 which are these like photos that I'm obsessively posting every day I'm actually posting them quite chronologically just to let you know for who might be asking themselves like what is going on here it is um Boccaccio 70 is an episode of Boccaccio 70 the movie where all of the famous uh from the 60s back then, famous uh, filmmakers contributed. So everybody got an episode. And uh, Lucchino Visconti got Act 3, or the third episode, in which uh, Romy Schneider is the star. And it's a... I mean, well, let's not spoil it. You could actually watch the movie. It's on YouTube. There's even... I mean, it's in Italian, but there is a... There is a low-res version of it with English subtitles as well. So, um, it I, I don't want to spoil the story, but I am more or less, I am, kind of. I'm posting chronologically the scenes as they're happening. So, my quarantine is unfolding a little bit like Romy Schneider's Day in that house. And by the way, so if you check out my Instagram, you're going to notice that uh, it um, there's a pattern. I'm not totally crazy. <laughs> there's, there's a pattern of how I post things and... The, the succession there there is a story behind uh which you know you can see it but you might not be able to see it but either way uh this i can tell you about the story romy never leaves the house that apartment so she is in kind of an isolation you know they shot everything indoors on on, on a set probably but that feeling of and you know and this is something david lynch also got inspired by definitely especially in twin peaks the return uh, when Audrey in Twin Peaks The Return kind of wants to leave the house but never leaves the house. So we have a similar situation happening with Romy Schneider, constantly dressed in Chanel. This entire movie is an advertisement for Chanel and the best advertisement that anybody could have ever made. Could you imagine Lucchino Visconti, the god of filmmaking, of beautiful filmmaking. He also directed, by the way, Maria Callas on stage for La Treviata. So imagine Lucchino Visconti dedicating an entire movie to Chanel because Romy Schneider is dressed in Chanel. From head to toe, from the beginning to the end of the movie. And as the movie progresses, she changes clothes. So as I'm recording now this podcast, the uh, I'm not there yet on my Instagram. I mean, she hasn't changed her outfit yet. 
in the chronology of the posts and of the photos that I'm posting, but she will soon. And, um, and, and she keeps changing and evolving. And there's like a Chanel 255 bag on the sofa. And then Romy takes her Chanel hat off and then she puts a Chanel ribbon in her hair. And then slowly she takes the jacket off. And then we see her with the sleeveless, gorgeous pink crepe de chine shirt on. And then it goes on and on and on. And then we have, she's going to, it's going to go through a lot. And then at the end, she even mentions Chanel. Now I posted just today, a photo of Romy getting ready for bath and uh, you see in the background a huge, ginormous bottle of pure perfume of Chanel Number no. 5. I mean, and it's so subtle because it's never really in focus. It's unfocused, but it's right there next to her head. And there's a close-up of Romy talking on the phone. I mean, that's Chanel. That's the essence of Chanel. And we have archival photos of Coco fitting the suits, the outfit oh, for Romy for, for this particular uh, movie. So bringing back to life that heritage of Coco Chanel, uh, but through the eye of, well, the media that we have today, of 2020, I mean, we have Instagram, we have digital photography. I can take screenshots of a movie and then retouch them and enhance them and push certain colors, you know, because actually these photos before I, I took the screenshots from the movies and then they're quite dark because the movie, even though this particular copy of the movie is remastered and has been restored, um, there's still you could still push more out of it so i've enhanced these photos i haven't retouched the facial features or anything but i've just added light luminescence to them i've added light and i've added uh you know just like in fragrances you would add aldehydes to make something sparkle in the opening notes i would add a little bit of sparkle to the first view so when you see this image of course it's not perfectly focused and sharp because i mean it is a grainy film material that's been retouched i mean that that's been restorated and then digitalized but that doesn't matter you know we live in this hyper digital era where everything has to be super hyper focused and, and sharp but it doesn't you guys i mean polaroid photos are so beautiful because they, they're alive they have these pigments that vibrate inside of them and they can never be really very focused and that's the beauty of them so i like that to translate that beauty of film onto digital into a digital format, as is a digital picture that you can post on Instagram, but then enhance it in a way that it still has that glow, that cinematic glow. And so I added a lot of light, a lot of highlights, toned down the uh, the warmth of the picture, made it a bit cooler, but I added saturation. So they pop more. They, they come more to life. They become more vibrant, just like the vibration that is needed in fragrances, if you want the vibration, you, you you obtain the vibration by adding aldehydes in the opening notes. So these photos of Romy Schneider throughout the uh, kind of chronology of my post, the continuity of the of my posts on on my Instagram, dedicated to Chanel mostly, uh, they they function as f fresh notes to this entire kind of juice that is uh, the chronology of, of my of my insta feed and i have been focusing on showing the essence of coco not the essence of chanel the brand and that's why you might think when you see these visuals that that something is slightly off it's not the trendy influencer instagram posts of somebody you know slightly turned to the side little girly, innocent pose, showing off their little Gabrielle bag just purchased. That ain't going to happen with me. Yeah, I ain't going to see that. You're going to see the heft of it. You're, <laughs> you're going to pose the passion for it, what is behind the surface. That's always what is important to me. And Coco, boy, did she have a lot behind the surface. It, it just, it's like an onion. You keep take peeling a layer off and then there's another layer underneath. And then you peel that layer off and then there's another layer underneath. This is also one of the reasons why I'm a huge fan of the Coco, the design of the Coco refillable Eau de Parfum bottle. Um, actually, I have it here uh, on the micro. You can't see it because this is a podcast, but you can hear it. I'm going to open it now. There you go. You take the lid off. Uh, it smells delicious. Put the lid back on. It's a 60 milliliter spray. It looks like a monolith. And I associate it often. I uh, compare it to Stanley Kubrick's monolith from Space Odyssey. Uh, I love the fact that um, how it functions. It's just it's so perfect. It almost is a little bit reminiscent of 
of the lacquered style of her Coromandel panels. And then, but then there's a layer underneath. The bottle is actually hidden inside. And the bottle inside does have an inscription. It does have an, its name, its logo, and everything is, you know, printed perfectly as if the bottle could be naked, but it's not because it's hidden underneath. So that's Chanel as well. And then inside the bottle is the juice that's also hiding. Um, you have to dig and dig and dig with Chanel to, to get to the core. And you're, you're still never going to get to the core because she kept hiding who she was. She kept hiding her her truths. And even so much so that she herself used to say in her uh, books, well, in her books, <laughs> the one, well, there's two actually, but the one that we can find, the other one is only in French and in Italian, but the one that we can find, the, the Paul Morand with Coco Chanel, the Allure of Chanel book, she does mention that she oftentimes loses herself in the labyrinth of her own myth. And by this, she's very well aware when she talks to people that she alters and changes stories, very much embarrassed that her father left her when she was really young and then he, she ended up in an orphanage and she kept lying to herself, not just to other people, but to herself, that he left to America and would, would come back, you know, and would take care of her and that he left her with her aunts, but they weren't her aunts, they were the nuns, you know, Bazin. And uh, so there's this whole world that she built. But you have to understand, the moral of those days was not the moral of today. So we cannot judge morally. When we dissect and go back into time and try to understand the life of a person, first of all, we can never understand it fully. We can perhaps grasp it a little bit or perhaps get a taste of it, but we can never understand it. And I think it's extremely presumptuous and arrogant of a lot of people trying to kind of saying like, oh, we know how she was. And all, you know, the, accuse, the accusations that were all pointed at her. Terrible, terrible stuff. All debunked, by the way. And that's also another thing. I get a lot of questions about that, but uh, let's not touch base on that because that's just a painful note and it's it's just hearsay. And and I hate how lemming people are such lemmings. They just fall for it. And oh, okay. I let's quickly touch base on this. There was this um another one of my uh, subscribers posted to me a link to, to some video of some somebody um talking about what a bad experience they had uh, shopping in a Chanel boutique. And and then somebody in the comments and it really and everything this person was was saying about how this person was behaving in the boutique. It was just wrong <laughs> from the beginning to the end. Everything this person did was wrong. So why would this person be surprised that this person wasn't treated in the right way? I mean, you gotta be, you, you gotta make this stuff up. I mean, you gotta be that arrogant and ignorant. But, and then in the comment section, people are also like, yeah, I hate it, hate it. You know, when people just get an opportunity to vent because they found an outlet where they can vent and then they all, and they could just be mean. And then somebody started talking about, you know, Coco's past. And did you know that she was this and that? And then all of these other people who didn't read one sentence on her life or anything, I don't know if they read any books in their life because most of these texts, most of these comments were also grammatically wrong and not written right. So you, you think, gee. And then all of a sudden, this one comment generated like 50 other comments that it just trickled through this like hate of people who, who know nothing, ignorance that takes people, pushes the masses and creates this monstrosity, this conglomerate of a bunch of people united just screaming at you like these monsters from the darkness. So, and the darkness is, is their darkness, is their ignorance. The darkness represents their ignorance and they just shout from that ignorant hole from which they come from. It's, it's, nauseating that type of human i cannot stand organically i i get like an allergic reaction to it so back to to back from the depths of despair humanity as uh something that really needs to change come become better or get the f out of here uh and um elevation right so Layers, layers, layers. You're peeling layers off and you're trying to get closer and closer and closer to somebody, but you can never really get close to a person, to their truth and to their core. So Chanel would lie about a lot of things because she felt embarrassed. She felt embarrassed by the fact that she was all alone. And for that time, and I, again, let's go back to this. You cannot judge those times with the moral of today. For a woman in the 1800s and early 1900s 
who not only uh, has no money, but has no family, <laughs> nobody, comes from a poor background and has literally nothing. For a woman from nothing, a woman, not even a man, a woman back then, to make it as far as Chanel did, that alone is harder, was harder than it is today to win the lottery. And we all know how impossible it is to win the lottery today. So it's a very special situation. You have to understand, for her to make it that far means that she had to have something more than just streetwise. She had talent, but she was also very disciplined. Very disciplined. She was a worker. In fact, she said to her, till her dying day, she said, you know, I'm a worker. I'm not an artist. I, I create. She would stand for hours and hours and hours and hours, create, you know, just fixing the shoulders. She was obsessed with the shoulders of her jackets on the mannequin or, or on whoever would come in 31 Rue Cambon to, to get fitted by her personally, even with her cigarette in her mouth and just like working on the shoulders, shoulder working, working, standing, standing, working. And she said, you know, I am a technician. And she was a master of her art, which was tailoring. Now, she said that she's going to die working. And the only reason why she's living a long life is because she can work. Work gives her life. And in fact, she died on a Sunday. And in fact, it is said that her last words were to her chambermaid at the Ritz. Uh, oh, of course I was going to die on a Sunday, the only day that I don't work. So you have to, you see, all of this comes together. It's, Chanel is, uh, she's a mystery. But at the same time, she's, She's a wonderful, a wonderful mystery because it's like a puzzle that you can see her from so many different points of view. And from every point of view, you see her. And even if you discover these little mysteries and these little secrets and these little lies and these little stories that she would alter just because she was embarrassed to say certain things about herself, from every perspective you see it, you fall in love with her more and more uh, because even though taken singularly, each one of these lies is a lie, put together, the more you know them, the more pieces you put together, and the more you realize that actually each one of those lies was a truth. Think about that. Always remember before you judge, try to see the bigger picture. Learn. Learn more about a person. Read more about a person. Don't just read one faction go to the other as well. Read differentiating opinions. Collect all of the opinions. Because at the end of the day, we could say there are certain facts that are maybe black and white on paper, but guess what? Even documents can be falsified and even documents can be altered by third parties. Uh, but everything else is an opinion. Everything else is an impression. When you meet a person, it's an impression that they leave on you. It's a lasting impression or no impression at all if the person just doesn't touch you in any way. And, and they just leave. But it's a feeling, it's a mood, it's an impression that they leave on you that stays with you. And that is what allows you to create an opinion on a person. And then, of course, their actions speak louder than words. But since we do not have actions here, we just have this legacy that she left behind, which is such a wonderful legacy in terms of fashion and in terms of visual visuals. It, what she left behind is so compelling. But not just visuals, also olfactory. Smell. The fragrances that she chose to release. Now, we know that Ernest Beau created the masterpieces of Chanel fragrance history. Nobody else came close. Jacques Poge, Henri Robert, I mean, as much as we love Chanel number no. 19, Henri Robert uh, is the nose behind it. To me, still, Ernest Beau takes the cake. And it's so fascinating because, like, the more time passes and you realize everything gets watered down. So, the first perfumer Chanel worked with Ernest Beau was the best. Henri Robert was also amazing, but was not as good as Ernest Beau. Jacques Polge, also great, but he never topped Chanel number no. 19. I, as much as I love Jacques Polge's creations, number 19 is a mythical creature, and uh, Jacques did not top it. And then after Jacques, we got Olivier Polge, and this is a bit tragic. The only really good ones he made are, like, really good is Ovive. Chance of Eve and Demisia. I'm okay with Chanel number no. 5 low. I really am. Uh, Gabrielle uh, Essence is also 
uh, it's an okay perfume. But as I said, you can watch my review. I mean, I said it's not a good Chanel perfume, but it's an okay perfume. But Mizia is Mizia is really good, and Mizia was his first Les Exclusives fragrance, official first launched perfume by Olivier Polge, uh, the son of Jacques Polge, was Mizia. And it's so beautiful that they launched Mizia on the 30th of March, 2015. The 30th of March is her birthday. So they kind of paid attention to that. Uh, I, I like that attention to detail. That's something Coco Chanel would have done too. She was obsessed with numbers. So Mizia is a good one. But you can't compare. And Olivier, I'm sorry, but you can't compete with Ernest Beau. I am liking also Olivier's uh, Les Eaux series. Uh, all of them, really. Paris Venice, Paris Deauville, Paris Biarritz, Paris Riviera, and I'm looking forward to Edinburgh. Uh, but they're, they're, they're cologne fresh waters of the tens, you know. And now the twenties, because Edinburgh is coming out in 2020. But they're not, and, and they're very modern. They're very today with with the heritage of Chanel at, at the, in their DNA. I, I see that. But they don't have that heft that Queer de Russie has, that Gardenia has, that Bois des Îles has, that Chanel number no. 22 have, that Chanel number no. 5 has. Those are the icons. It's thanks to those pillars that we can build this monument today. You know, th they're keeping the foundation of this uh, huge... Uh, mansion or of this or or castle even, and without them none of this would be possible. So Ernest Beau stands there right on top of that Olympus, and it's kind of sad that with every generation changing with the perfumers, it kind of waters down. You know, we we're going further and further away from the original, and this is why I'm grasping on to those rare moments in terms of Chanel the brand uh, products. I'm grasping on to those pieces that represent her. Coco that, that she would have made or pieces that reference directly her creativity and that's why all of the costume jewelry that I have is costume jewelry that I buy thinking about her uh, and and the bags as well you know most of the bags I have from Chanel are 255 the 255 is just there's nothing better than that and the other uh, timeless classics that I have our excursions into a, a more whimsy, perhaps more trivial approach to Chanel, which I can also see her kind of liking, maybe because they're very simple in their construction. But um, but but that would be it, really. All the other new bags coming out are mm, not really for me. I was there's this one bag that I bought from the last uh, Karl Lagerfeld Metier Da collection, uh, which is an oversized bum bag. But that's because I really, really appreciated the fact that Lagerfeld, just like Chanel did, you know, Chanel collaborated with Salvador Dali, with uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, with Jean Cocteau, but the two painters in particular. So Lagerfeld also collaborated with an artist with a graffiti artist to create the canvases the Chanel canvases for these bags so to have something so to have streetwear with because you know Chanel was obsessed with reaching the streets and that's why this bum bag made out of this very simple cotton canvas printed with the print of this artist co that collaborated with Lagerfeld for the sake of Chanel I found that very poetic uh, so you know in many, many reviews, and also in a couple of books that are, have been written about Chanel, she does state, these books state, but also she does state in interviews, that uh, she was always very fascinated when she found on markets, on street markets and street vendors, selling copies of her stuff. Now, a lot of people are going to say, what? She must have been really offended. No, she called them my little Chanel's. <laughs> she thought that was amazing that the masses that could not afford her expensive clothing, the masses that, the poor masses that actually where she comes from, that they accepted her, that they thought that she was good enough to be copied, that they thought that she was something to look up to. She came from them. And so for her, it was a privilege to see on the streets them selling their, her little imitation bags or her little you know, the jacket or the shape of, of, of maybe a brooch or some costume jewelry styled the way that she would style them. Um, th in this respect, Chanel hitting the streets uh, is 
how I saw Lagerfeld working on that particular oversized bum bag it made in that cotton with the Gros Grand inside, which is the same Gros Grand used for the original 255 bag on the interior, you see. And uh, it's a completely, it's a bag made completely out of fabric. I mean, well, the chain has an interwoven leather piece through it, but the bag itself is cotton with the silk inside. But that, to me, could have been a modern-day Chanel. And that's why I accept that bag, and actually that's why I love that bag so much. Um, and in general, if you're going to go for a Chanel bag, yes, we love the leather, but the more time passes and the more I'm obsessed with the fabrics. Uh, and in fact, all of the kind of the newest Chanel bags that I purchase are always in, in, in some fabric material because they're her tweeds and the velvets and the jerseys and also the cottons and the silks. They're just incredible. I mean, there's nothing more luxurious than a Chanel bag that has some form of fabric uh, covering it. That is the DNA of Coco. That is the DNA of Chanel. And quite frankly, uh, you know, everything else is just trend. And a cringy one at that. And most of the time, it's just really uh, a fad, an influencer fad, something you're going to see on some bimbo photographed on some beach while she's sipping on some ho cocktail to show off uh, the bag and the tanned skin. But uh, that that's... And then what? Two months later, she ain't going to wear that bag no more. And it's like not trendy anymore. Trend and style rarely go hand in hand. And when they do, then you have really a timeless piece on your hands. But most of the time, trend just dies off. You know, it just stays trend. And and once it's dead, it's dead. You got to be looking for something else. And then you're thinking, oh, gee, all the money you spent on that particular piece. It was like so cool a month ago and already it's not. And... And then you try to sell it off, but then nobody wants to give you that money for it, you know. And then it's all kind of thing. Buy what you truly love. Don't buy what you see some bimbo wear on Instagram or on any other platform for that matter. Because, well, chances are they're either paid by somebody to wear it or, you know, they're faking it. And here we open a whole other can of worms in terms of who is wearing what and what does it represent and what does it really mean and manipulation of masses and marketing strategies. And so there you have to be very cautious and very careful. Do not let these brands manipulate you. There's a difference between what you want and what you need. Those are two different worlds. And then, of course, you have to know what you want and what you need are are both essential, really, but you just have got to know how to distinguish the difference between the two, what you want and what you need. I think Coco Chanel was very aware of that, and I think she was really good at differentiating the needs and the wants, and was very, very instinctive that way, and she would really always go for the jugular, meaning she would know what she wanted, and she would know what she needed, and she would know how to differentiate them. So, um... Do you want to buy a Chanel bag or do you need to buy a Chanel bag? The answer is usually you don't need to. You want to. But then, why do you want to buy a Chanel bag? Because you want to look cool? You want to show it off to others? But then, you see, there we go back to, well, but then, he that's a need. There's an problem at the core there's a deficit at the core you have a complex you think you're worth you're worthless and you're worth less so worthless so you need to prove something so that that, that's a need so you need that bag but you don't really need the bag you need to prove a point but proving that point is actually just should be proving to you the point that you have a deficit. You're lacking something. you got to work on that rather than on craving a bag that is not going to fulfill and not going to fix the problems that you have inside. So you see how tricky it is? The want and the need? Very, very tricky. Chanel mastered, uh, I think, mastered that path, that kind of 
that path that splits into the two ways of the needing and the wanting. Okay, guys, this was my first podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. Very symbolic, like ending it around 55 minutes because 55, you know, it's very symbolic. So uh, 55 minutes for the first podcast dedicated to Chanel. Thank you guys so much for listening and tuning in. Subscribe to my channel here on YouTube if you haven't already. Thumb up this podcast slash video. That's not a video, but it is a video, but it's not. And um, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And also, thank you to my patrons on Patreon. This podcast is ad-free while ads are running through it on YouTube. Super Dacob, all spelled together. Until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye.